Chief of Defense Staff General Loki Irabo announces the death of ISWAP leader Abu Musab al Banawi. Direct primaries. Is this what's needed to create a level playing field and save our political parties? Find out later on the show. And blessing Okagbae in the spotlight for the wrong reasons. We'll talk about her failed drug test sometime this morning. Friday morning and we'll say thank you for joining us here on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's the final episode for this week and we hope that you've had a very interesting run with us all through the week. I am Osaogi Ogbonwa. And I am Messi Ibopo. Thanks for joining us. As always, we kick off the program with uh, talking about top trending stories and share with you some of the things that have created interesting conversations across the country in the last 24 hours. We're starting with uh, issues concerning security with, uh, the, of course, the Chief of Defense Staff, Major General uh, Loki Rabo, uh, sharing yesterday that the leader of ISWAP in Nigeria, uh, Al Banawi, um, is dead. And of course, this of course got uh, a lot of reactions from people across the country. With you know many of them celebrating, but of course you would also get to see a couple of those who say, "Well, you know, it's pretty much the same way." Um, the Nigerian Army reported that um, um, Shikau was dead a couple of times, um, and he you know keeps resurfacing, uh, but eventually was killed by the same ISWAP. And just to give a quick um, um, history, Abanawi apparently is the son of Muhammad Yusuf, the founder of Boko Haram. They broke out sometime, I believe, in 2016 and started, uh, of course, joined forces with ISIS and set up the, uh, you know, ISWAP here in Africa and, of course, uh, in West Africa, to be precise. Um, he then, of course, has continued to lead that wing. If you've listened to also our security analysts on the program, they've also tried to distinguish between the actions and the, you know, the, the mode of operation of ISWAP compared to Boko Haram and then, of course, to bandits and the likes um, in the north part of, Ni north part of Nigeria. Um, and so they've always had their own, you know, motives and their own, you know, mode of operation. Um, and, of course, have also been seen to be very, very deadly. We've also seen a couple of the attacks on Nigerian army um, 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 officers and, um, you know, attacks in villages here and there. You, you know, of course, must have heard them be committed by the same group. And so Abanawi, you know, has been leading that group since they were formed sometime, I believe, in 2016. Um, Abubakar Shekau uh, was killed sometime early this year. And, of course, uh, reports have it that it was killed by factions from ISWAP. Or, you know, it was a clash between both sides. Currently, the uh, defense chief, uh, Loki Rabo, has not been able to clarify exactly what led to the death of uh, Al Banawi. But, you know, there's, of course, uh, thoughts that it might also be internal clashes between uh, the terror groups or maybe a reprisal attack from Boko Haram. No one is sure yet. Uh, but, of course, I hope that we'll be able to find out more details and get to share with you. Well, it, it probably would be a good one uh, for the military and for Nigeria, if that's really the case. But as usual, uh, I think that the people of Nigeria, I mean, the Nigerian uh, people have actually lost confidence because for, for every time you hear the government make pronouncement or you hear security agents or agency makes, uh, make pronouncement, you find that, that a lot of people uh, are in doubt. So people begin to raise raise questions and it will be okay to say these questions are quite valid for me i would ask have they seen the body did they see the body or is this just hearsay how are we sure that he is dead uh, so so it's also another thing i think that if um, he comes up with a lot of clarity uh talking about the details i mean what led to his death and and let the people know that okay this is what happened and this is how it happened and they are able to confirm that yes we have seen you know the cops it would be a good one well, um, um you know i guess and i agree with that um but you know for now i think you know he he has stated that he's dead i think he, he said he's, he's dead he's and sure. he's dead um there's also real. reports that um he had died sometime in september actually it didn't happen in the last couple of days i, mm -hmm. I saw uh you know someone you know share some information saying that he had died sometime in september um but it only became confirmed today and of course earlier um, sometime in September when the news broke, you know, very, very likely that Abanawi was killed. Aesop did come out to, you know, deny that. Even if he himself, Abanawi, didn't show face to say, okay, no, that is, a, you know, a false story. 
Uh, but now that the defense chief has said it, you know, they still haven't responded or said anything concerning that. So it might be actual confirmation that is that. You know, well, look, maybe they, we just need to give it a few more days or thereabouts well, and see um, if... Well, uh, and I understand, you know, the lack of trust with, you know, words from the Nigerian army, you know, but I, I personally would like to, uh, you know, somehow I would like believe. to believe that he truly is uh, mm. dead. Um, but of course, the important you know, of, uh, questions moving forward are, you know, what next, you know, and, you know, how does this in any way affect uh, the strength of ISWAP as a terror group? Does it, you know, in any way affect the ability to, you know, continue to co uh, cause harm against the Nigerian state and uh, commit crimes against the Nigerian state and, and terrorize Nigerian people um, and people in the Lake Chad region also? And also, will someone then be taken over from, you know, um, Abanawi? Well, you know, like with every organization, I mean, if you look at really their structures, so uh, and if you see the operations of uh, the security, I mean, of these terror groups over over the time or over the years, you would find out that uh, they have a, a very structured pattern. So I'm not sure that uh, Paraventure, he is dead for real. Uh, I'm sure that there's a plan to have someone else who would take over. I mean, so yeah. it might necessarily not really, really impact on their activities. Uh, you know, they have a lot of membership, uh, followership. I'm sure that there would be uh, someone who is in command, second in command, if you like to say. I would like to see a lot, of, a lot more local derbies between uh, these groups. And I mean, um, fights in between these terror groups. Let Boko Haram <laughs> continue to attack ISWAP. Let ISWAP continue to attack Boko Haram until they completely reduce their numbers and... Um, you know, they, they kill themselves off, you know, because uh, these, this is not a, you know, death that is sad for anybody. Mm. You know, I'm sure even including Alban Awi's family. Um, mm. This is a death that should be celebrated, you know, the same way the world celebrated when Osama bin Laden was killed. True. And, you know, and, and a couple of ISIS leaders, um, you know, across the world that have also been killed by the U.S. and by foreign forces, um, you know, there was celebration. So I'm thinking, you know, we should have the same reaction here. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, this is not our only security challenge. And so there's still Boko Haram, there's still the banditry, there's still uh, a couple of these groups here and there that have continued to wage war against the Nigerian state. Um, this is in the news also, I believe that um, five soldiers, were, I believe, were killed um, in the last 48 hours. And so these, there's still security concerns. Um, and we shouldn't, <clears throat> aside celebrating, yes, that one major factor, that one major person you know, in, in um, these groups has been killed, um, it shouldn't let anyone relax and feel like the war is over. It's, it's not won yet and we will continue to Until. fight. Definitely. So moving away from uh, security now, let's talk about uh, Mari Dwana. And uh, this is Bonner Boy uh, as a result of, I mean, that gist has actually been making the round where he uh, granted an interview uh, in Los Angeles talking about the fact that, yes, everyone is smoking weed, but the truth is Nigerians are hypocritical. I, I love Burner Boy a lot. I'm a great fan. But you know as it is, you can actually have um, absolutes. They're no absolutes. They're relative. So I think that I would like to fault him on that to say that everyone is smoking. Yes, you probably might just have a, a, a vast majority smoking, but you can't say everyone is actually uh, smoking weed at the time. So on that particular one, I mean, because it would just be hasty generalization, it's possible that uh, if you run your statistics, you say out of 100, uh, if you're looking at, you're talking about percentage, you could probably say, okay, about 80%, uh, but how, how are we sure? So for him to just uh, make I, that I pronouncement. I don't think you can say 80%. I think it, I think I'm just it saying that was him, you know, just exaggerating, you know, and, you know, mm. trying to make, you know, he, he's trying to paint a picture. That everybody. Obviously not everybody is. Um, mm. um, I'm sure even people around him, the people, a lot of people around him who aren't, you know, using marijuana. Um, but he's trying to pr paint a picture, you know, that the Nigerian society really is hypocritical. And I, I agree with him. Um, there's a lot of, the, uh, you know, people who do use um, you marijuana, know, um, a marijuana and, and, you know, and all the drugs. Um, but we, you know, always like to act, you know, like we don't. We, tr we uh, as a society, like to criminalize things that we indulge in, you know, um, very, very much. Um, we, of course, like to create this false image of ourselves, you know, and then leave an entirely different life behind closed doors. And that's what he's referring to. Well, but, regards, but, but would you would you blame, I mean, would you blame the Nigerian people? Because, I mean, this is this is a culture. Let's not forget that this is Nigeria and this is Africa. And, uh, you know, growing up in this part of the world, you know, there are do, do's and don'ts and what you have to do over time. So I'm thinking that, you know, culture has a serious re role, you know, is, huge regardless role. of what the, you know, the reason is, might be cultural, might be religious, might be, um, you know, my church said this or my mosque said this, 
But that's, you know, it doesn't change the fact that we're hypocritical. Yeah, because, very you know, if you're hiding behind religion or culture or tradition um, to live a life, you know, on the outside and then going home to do what you truly want to do, then it's still being, you're still being a hypocrite. Um, and, you know, I, I, the point he is trying to make really is that he doesn't understand why it is an illegal substance in Nigeria. Um, when, you know, in other, you know, countries that have, you know, way, you know, better laws and, you know, have way better systems, you know, marijuana is not necessarily illegal. Yes, with, you know, there's, um, you know, level of um, uh, the quantities that they use, of course, to make it le illegal or illegal. You cannot be, um, um, you can't sell, you know, in large quantities or something like that. Um, but, you know, there's certain amounts that you can, you know, be found with in public and it's not a problem. You're not well, but, but like I, I said earlier on, you know, we're very big on religion, we're very big on culture. And uh, if you talk about legalizing this substance, sure I think pastors, that that's... Uh, I'm sure pastors... I, I, can't, I can't verify. No, I can't no, verify it doesn't, any it doesn't need to be verified. I'm 100% sure. I mean, you're speculating. No, have you found any... Have you found any... Okay, you know some pastors. pastors that use ahead, marijuana. That's it. Then. And so it's not... Listen... I, I totally, I, 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 I totally understand. This is, this is I totally understand just, where you're coming the from. The point I'm trying to make is with you know the level of hypocrisy in Nigeria. This sure. is not just with marijuana. Mm. It's pastors that use marijuana. There's pastors that, that carry um, sex workers. There's past. And I'm sorry, I'm going to be saying pastor because I don't know any imams or any you know um, Muslim leaders. But pastors, there's a lot of them that do these same things that will come out in public and strongly criticize. Same thing with our political leaders and people in National Assembly, governors, they do these same things. That they go back to the National Assembly and criminalize. They do. They, they take part in these same things. They use drugs. I'm not and disputing. I, I remember, I'm I remember not disputing it was in the that. news a couple of days ago that mm -hmm. um, uh, um, a, a drug test should be compulsory for people contesting in Kano State um, um, for office. I'm not sure which of the elections in, in Kano State. And that really just tells you how much usage there is. And we keep deceiving ourselves. You know, and one of the things that I, I, I want to understand with our making marijuana illegal is what exactly, why is that is it a problem in Nigeria? In what way is it a challenge for the Nigerian society? In what way does it lead to crime? Is it, a, is it health, you know, related, you know, that, that makes it illegal? So it brings us back to the same thing I'm saying. Yes. I totally agree with you that uh, a lot of persons are indulging and we're hypocritical about it because, you know, we want to put up a good face. We always want to act like we're perfect and we have it all going together. And I say, you blame that on religion and you blame that on culture. So that's it. And because, you know, different kinds of religion that we do have. And so uh, we would always hide behind religion, we would always hide behind all of that and begin to say, I mean, it reminds us of the conversation we had yesterday, what is actually wrong or right? So uh, that's really the case. But also asking why we haven't actually prioritized it. Uh, or made it uh, legal, I would think it's just a matter of uh, uh, parity. Because at the end of the day, if you want to look at it, uh, you know, in the scale of preference, the things that are bothering us as a country, should that be, you know, a major concern? Absolutely not. You know, and, and I also, I'm, I'm not necessarily, I'm not also pushing for it to be made legal. You know, I don't, I don't see the importance, uh, to be honest. But the challenge that I have is, or what, what I find worrisome is um, the fact that it is illegal um, for, you know, one reason or the other, maybe mm. because of the, um, you know, security concerns, you know, and, and the, the picture that has been painted that people that use marijuana are more prone to crime or committing crime, or maybe because of the health, you know, concerns, what Nigeria has not been able to answer any actual health questions. So I'm not even sure why we do that. But the challenge that I have is the fact that once you make a thing illegal in Nigeria, it has given the Nigerian police that leverage to abuse Nigerian rights. And there's so many, many stories of people who are stopped and you know you know on the road and searched like they like they have been confirmed criminals. If you go if you drive around Lekki at night because I I live in Lekki. If you drive around phase 1 at night, once it's 10 p.m. on a from Wednesday till Sunday, there's police checkpoints in certain places. They don't look for crime on Monday or Tuesday, or sometimes <laughs> even Wednesday itself. But once it's a weekend and there's going to be a lot of people outside, they, you know, set up their checkpoints and they start searching people randomly, certain checkpoints, certain people randomly, looking out for ways, you know, that they can implicate them in something. Sometimes it's a tiny, tiny little bit of, of anything that looks like a plant. They immediately say it's marijuana and then you're going to be arrested. You have to bail yourself and some of all of that madness. Um, and that's, you know, how the Nigerian police and Nigerian security agents have taken advantage of things like that, um, which makes absolutely no sense. And so um, 
I don't necessarily need it to be legal, but I think or need it to be legal. But I think we need to have a conversation um, amongst Nigerians and find out exactly what of some of our laws that need to be to be changed or need to be spoken about more clearly instead of deceiving, our, deceiving ourselves as a country. Mm. Hopefully, we get to that point where we get to talk about it. And away from that, uh, this particular one we saw yesterday. I mean, when I actually read that story. I was cracking up really, really hard. I mean, about the picture of a young lady who was in a bus, and she said um, the driver actually yeah. asked her to I match think the we brakes. Can, we can share that picture. Mm. Um, it went viral across social media yesterday. It should be on your screen in just a few seconds. A lady who, of course, was in a bus. Yes, there you have it. Uh, she says uh, the driver asked her to step on the brakes so he can get in the fight. But, I mean, yes, it will crack. Why don't, you say, why don't you say it the way she said it? Make her go beat person. <laughs> My opinion is not very good when I'm in front of camera. You know, when I'm with my friends, my opinion okay. Is not, not okay. Um, <laughs> so, so the thing is, so so this is this is a very very serious serious issue. That's not serious. This is a very stereotypical Lagos picture. This is some of the things that you can see in Lagos, and just know that yes, this is a city that you are in. Um, I've seen worse. I've seen people who drive without actual fuel, uh, fuel tanks and they have a 25-litre um, um, you know, jerry can in the back of the car. Um, I'm talking about Lagos buses now. They have a 25-litre jerry can in the car where they, of course, where the four pump or four hose is connected to and that's how they move. That's how they, their vehicles run. I've seen all the pictures where um, you know, someone was um, asked to help him change gear. I've seen there's a video online even where the the steering wasn't working, the Lagos bus steering wasn't working, and so the driver when he tries to turn, the conductor has to come down from the car and use his hands to actually turn the tires by himself so they can move in a different direction. So it's a very very common you know Lagos story. Uh, I, I really don't want to say, but you know, every time I think about it and I I just uh, keep imagining the scenario, I just you know, keep cracking up yeah. because it's very funny. Now, so for me, what I, I thought about was what if she, she didn't match the brakes, what's going to happen? So eventually if she did not put her foot on that, uh, you know, brake, it's possible that the bus would be running and yeah. she could be in danger. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I can't really, really imagine if you were in that situation, what you will do. But it's just really about the madness that exists in the city, mm. you know. And I'm, I'm not saying that in a, you know, in a negative way, but you know, the the madness in Lagos, you know. And so anything that you see, you just you know take it like that as part of your journey through Lagos, <laughs> you know, and your experiences through Lagos. You know, I remember when uh, there was a you know a, a new decree by the Lagos State government that you know Okada riders must use helmets, and you saw some people using buckets uh, to cover their heads. I remember also <laughs> when they when they and um, um, uh, bikes, motorcycles uh, in Lagos. And uh, they said that only dispatch riders and, uh, you know, bikes of a certain class will be able to move across Lagos. I remember that I saw people using uh, the same bikes, you know, but they put some, um, um, I think it was a refuse bin or something behind to look like it was a dispatch, um, a dispatch uh, rider. Um, you know, just carry. I mean, it had something behind it, so you might as well call it a call it. And, and the one that I saw uh, recently that was really very amazing to me is, uh, uh, you know, so some of these uh, heavy duty vehicles conveying sensitive products like fuel and all of that. So I saw this young lad, he was just close to, you know, you know how you're trying to just move from one point to the other. So behind this heavy duty vehicle, that's, that's a very sensitive product. Anything can happen. And he was just leaning very comfortably and being transported from one point up until he got to his yeah. destination. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, what is going on? It's Lagos, same Lagos where, you know, bus drivers will come out and strip naked because someone is trying to impound their vehicle, you know, and they would fight stark naked um, in the middle of the road, broad daylight <laughs> by 2 p.m. and, you know, hot sun. And so these okay. are these aren't you know things that you know Lagosians are alien to. They see these things every day, and you know it's just you know time for a good laugh once again. Yes. Anyway, Friday morning. Thanks for joining us once again. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're getting into off the press with Gide Johnson to share his thoughts on some of the stories making headlines across Nigeria today.